Since we're going to be doing some work with the test roll, it's almost impossible to look underneath the piano while and do this because of the camera shots and the lighting and the rest of it. So what I'm going to do, what right, I have here, is a Duard Grand Expression box. And this one has been restored. And I want to show you some things on, on this so that when we're working with the test roll, we know what we're talking about. All right, first of all, these are the accordion pneumatics. Now, the accordion pneumatics originally were covered with leather. But again, there's a problem with the leather that's available today. They were covered with a very fine grain leather, which was sealed with some substance, because even though it was a fine grain leather, there was enough porosity to cause some problems. And the leather before it was put on here was stretched. There is a rather hefty spring tension that is constantly on these accordion pneumatics. And unless the leather is pre-stretched, what happens is that over a period of time, this constant pulling up by these springs causes the, the whole accordion to be stretched out of position, and all of these carefully made spacings are destroyed. So I think that perhaps today, the best solution for this, or the best material for this, is this polyurethane nylon cloth. The stretch is held to a minimum. The cloth is very thin, so that you don't have any problems with it collapsing. It's very easy to work with, and it seems to be very, very successful. Uh, here on the accordion pneumatics, we can see the various four tubes, because there are four different stages, and the four tubes that emits the vacuum to the various four chambers of the accordion pneumatics. And there are three sets of these stops one here, one here, and then a very difficult set to set back here. And these set the travel. In a properly set duor, uh, we start out with the first or the smallest pneumatic, smallest accordion pneumatic being set at a sixteenth of an inch, the next one at an eighth of an inch, the next one as a fourth of an inch, and the one at the very bottom here at a half an inch, so that each of these steps are constantly doubled. Now, these spacings, of course, might be changed when we work with the test roll. For instance, if we find that uh, on the chord tests that we're not making, when the chord should play, they're not, then we would want to increase the spacing, if it's we're working on step number one, slightly to, to allow the chords to play. If we find that they're not, or they're doing something else, then we can adjust these steps accordingly to, make, to, to meet the test roll conditions. Now, after we get through with the rest uh, restoring the accordions, then in most cases we have to take all of this apart, of course, and we have to split the box in half because in the middle of the box on a wooden shelf, just about at this level, and in here, two of them here and one of them here are three pouches. When the Aeolian Company made this theme box, they thought if there was ever any problem with the pouches, of course, you would simply send to the factory and get a new one of these bodies and simply be very simple. would be rather inexpensive. However, uh, these are not any longer available, haven't been for 40 years, and so what we have to do is split the box apart and replace the pouches inside. John Grant wrote a marvelous article on how to do this, and it's being reprinted in technicalities, and it also was printed in the bulletin. And rather than go through the whole steps, I leave it for you to read and follow his very, very clear and explicit directions on how to take the, the expression box apart and how to replace those pouches. A few other things we have to check. Um, we have to check this mechanical linkage. Let me turn the box around so that you can clearly see. As the accordion depresses, then it moves this forward, which of course opens the knife valve and gives you a higher vacuum level and makes the dual art play louder. The important thing is that as you just cause this to move ever so slightly, that all of that motion, even the tiniest amount of motion, is transmitted directly to this lever. It has to go from here to this lever here without any loss. Now, if you have worn bearings, say in here or in here, you're going to find that as the accordion begins to, to collapse, 
that the steps will not be repeatable and on these very small steps, and remember this only collapses a sixteenth of an inch, that the motion, rather than being transmitted to the knife valve through this rod, is going to simply be used in moving this back and forth if this happens to be a sloppy bearing. So what you want to check is to make sure that this bearing is quite tight, that the leather bushing cloth, or the, not leather, the um, felt bushing cloth has not been worn, and in fact it's usually a good idea just generally to replace it because it's had quite a bit of life and it might be just beginning to go. Uh, inside you will want to take and clear up the, or clean up the knife valves. You want to re-graphite them. There's some silencing uh, uh, cloth in there that you will want to clean up. Uh, in general, look uh, for any problems that you might have, any cracks in the box, um, any pieces of shaving that might have gotten caught in there. It's usually a good idea that when you restore the box that you take these fittings off and then replace the gaskets with fresh leather gaskets rather than using the old one. You'll find that most of the time these gaskets underneath these elbows has pretty much deteriorated. And if you don't replace them, you're going to get a bunch of leaks. And of course, you'll want to go through this particular valve, which is the crash valve, change its pouch, make sure that its seating is, uh, its leather seats are fine, and that the uh, that the uh, valve travel is also adjusted in that. Uh, these two nipples, of course, are connected to the theme primaries. And down here we have the two springs. Now, in this later box, we find that the springs are two different sizes. The lighter spring is for the accompaniment. The heavier spring is for the theme. This is to make sure the theme is always slightly more than the accompaniment. And over here, we have the uh, crash valve. Uh, you can use this crash valve, or you can replace it with a pouch series. There was an article written in uh, uh, in one of the technicality, I think, Volume Two, on, uh, so Volume Three, on how to replace uh, this particular pallet valve with a uh, with a series of pouches, which do the same thing. If you decide to stay with the original pouch or the original pallet valve, then please go underneath here and replace these leather. Faces. They are usually starting to deteriorate, and you're going to have all sorts of problems with the crash coming on when it's not supposed to. And, and so, please re replace the leather that you have uh, that are that it's underneath there. In general, the box, the expression box, should be cleaned up, adjusted, and uh, everything should be. The spring tension, for instance, should be checked. Here we have two springs, one for the accordion itself and one for the manual controls. That should be checked. And of course, all the cloths should be changed and the leather pouches inside should be changed. We're now at the piano and what we're going to do is we're going to go through the various steps of setting the piano intensities, checking out the various actions in the piano, and basically going through the whole duart test roll. It's a good idea before you begin any of this to pump out the tracker bar. Especially if you play a lot of recut rolls, they tend to have a lot of chaff or tiny bits of paper. And by using the tracker bar pump, this will clean a lot of it out. Uh, you simply put the pump on the tracker bar and move it a few holes over and pump each of the positions, making sure you have a, a good tight seal between this rubber tip and the tracker bar itself. And so forth. Tonight I'm using a, the QORS recut, which is a very fine recut of the, of the Duart test roll. This is the what test roll we normally use. It's the original Duart test roll number three. It's the one that fits most of the duarts. And we can go through each of the sections of the duart test roll and see how they apply. Uh, this particular test roll has a nice heavy leader, so if you do a lot of testing, you won't rip up the lead of the test roll. It also has, I could show you this coming up, uh, very nice diagrams of the various levers and direction so that when you use this particular test roll, it's not necessary to go back and forth between a test cue sheet 
to see what you're supposed to be doing for each test because each test on this particular test roll is very carefully marked. There is a very large section of printing here describing the dual art control levers uh, below the keys. There is one section here which is very important. It says test the piano action. Before you can really regulate carefully a grand action or an upright action or upright piano or grand piano, the action itself has to be regulated. And this means time. If you can't do it, uh, your tuner should do it. But it doesn't make much sense to try to finally regulate a duart if the piano action isn't capable of responding. Um, uh, the first thing we have to check in the tracker or in the uh, test roll is to see that the tracker is, is working correctly. And you can do this by moving the ears and seeing that there's a shift and also to see that the ears are just touching the paper um, and it also to see that it's centered. This is all very carefully described here and it's also described in the test book which you can read and follow the directions there. Um, the first test that we come to is the test of the, sp the roll speed. We're going to test this roll at speed 70. And what this basically means is that we will expect that seven feet of the roll will play in exactly one minute. This is the standard for all player rolls. A speed of 50 means that five feet will play for a minute, 60, six feet will play for a minute, for per one minute. 100 means 10 feet per minute, and 120 means 12 feet per minute. Uh, Duart has chosen 70, which is a good average. Uh, many of their rolls are recorded in the 70, 80, 90 range. And the first directions they give you is to move the dual art connector or the dual art lever to off so that it will turn on what's called the 88 note, note pneumatic so that some notes will speak. We're going to check a couple of things. While we'll check the timing, and there will be a couple of uh, double notes that sound which start the beginning of the timing, we are also going to check the repetition to make sure that each note repeats uh, clearly and distinctly and that uh, we don't have any notes that are not playing or notes that can be slightly clogged up. Uh, it's a good idea if you're using any test roll to make sure that the seven feet that are supposed to be there are seven feet. In this particular test roll, it did come out that the seven feet was exactly seven feet. But I have seen test rolls where the seven feet has been six and a half feet, seven and a half feet. So you must check that out. All right, we're about ready to begin this test. Uh, we just advance the test roll just about where the note is supposed to start. I will check my watch, and we start now. That indicates one foot. There's three feet. And this is three and a half feet, which should be 30 seconds, and it is. Five feet. Six feet. And seven feet is coming up, and we're within one second, which is certainly close enough for our purposes. They give you the mark halfway through at three and a half feet, so that if you're really far off, um, you can stop then so you won't have to waste time going through the whole minute. Now, if you find that the tempo is incorrect, then you must go underneath the piano to the tempo, to the uh, regulator that regulates the air to the roll motor and either loosen the spring or tighten the spring. If the roll motor is going too slowly, then you tighten the spring, giving it a little more air. If it's going too rapidly, then you loosen the spring, giving it a little less air. 
The next test we're going to come to is the test of the sustaining and soft pedal. And here in very, very large print, it warns you to put the dual lever to on. If you forget to put it to on, then the, other, the rest of the tests are coming up are going to be absolutely, you will not be able to make the tests. And they will be meaningless. We're going to check here to see that the sustaining pedal bridges or that it goes on and goes off. There are two perforations over on this part of the test roll which will test the, the sustaining pedal. The sustaining pedal should go on, drop off, and then come on again with this set of bridging. And it does. Now we can check the soft pedal and see that it bridges also. And we see the keys drop, and it does. And now we're going to do, we're going to check each of the accompaniment. Now let me go over here to this and show you what's going to be happening underneath the piano. It's simply impossible to get a camera underneath the piano to show you what happens. And so what I've done is I've brought our old friendly expression box here and show you what's going to be happening. When we come to the first accompaniment, which is going to be on the test roll, and when that number one accompanied my dynamic, dynamic comes up, this should collapse. And it should collapse. We should have set all of these for about the correct spacing. This would be 1 16th, 1 8th, 1 4th, and 1 half. And so this one should collapse. Nothing else should be moving. We should also see, remember that this lever over here is also moving to advance the knife valve ever so slightly. Now, please remember that you must have all of this slop in here taken out because when this collapses, there is very, very little movement over here. But that movement is very important in soft playing. When we come to the number two dynamic hole, of course, it's going to be this dynamic that collapses, the second one, not the first one, not the third, only the second one. When number four comes along, of course, it's this one that's collapsing. And finally, when number eight comes along, it's this one that's the half inch that collapses. You have to check these out for several reasons. One, you want to see that they're collapsing, uh, that the right ones are collapsing, and also that they're collapsing quickly, but not overly noisily. The next test that comes along is a combination of number two and number eight. And that gives us step number 10. Now, that's an important step because what we want to check now is to see how our spill is doing. Now let me, now let me talk a bit just about the minute of, about this felt that's in this hole right here because that felt uh, really regulates the amount of air that goes into the duo art when everything is at rest. Now remember that when this particular pneumatic moves forward, uh, it's going to cut off this knife valve, so the knife valve is going to be completely closed when the step gets 10 or above. But in these lower, especially when it's all the way open, it's this particular amount of felt, how it's packed in there, that determines how much air is being bled into the pump. Now, we don't want to have the pump working too hard, so we want to check the pressure that the pump is producing when everything is at rest. And we're going to use a gauge like this. We can go in, and if we've rebuilt this expression box according to John Grant's uh, instructions, we will have a test tap that will tell us the pump pressure. On the other hand, if we haven't done that, then we can go into the piano just below the key bed where the shifter pneumatics are, and we can attach our gauge onto the uh, nipple there, and we can get pressure, pump pressure, direct pump, pump pressure at that point. The important thing is that we want to get this pump pressure down to about 20, uh, 22. And we want to keep it around 22 to 24. If we check and we find that our pump pressure is much higher than that, say up in the 30s, then we want to be able to open this up. And we're going to check our pump pressure with the air motor running. So one of the things we've got to do is we've got to reach inside here and throw this chain off so that the chain doesn't turn the roll. We've got everything now. We have blank paper where the roll is. We will want to turn the pump now, and we'll have the pump running at about 70, which seems to be a good, good portion. Now, this itself is going to be bleeding a good, be did a, a good bit of air into the pump itself. Now we take our gauge and we check. If we find, for instance, that our pump pressure is still up around 30, 
Then we want to open this hole up. We want to press the felt back, maybe even remove a tiny bit of felt and check it out. On the other hand, if we find that our pump pressure now has dropped to say 20 or 21, then we want to close this felt up a little bit so that we don't bleed quite as much air in. And this really can be critical. If our pump pressure is, with the roll motor running, is much less than say 22, we're not going to have enough vacuum to operate these pneumatics or the sustaining pneumatics or other accessory devices. If, on the other hand, we find that our pump pressure is much higher than, say, 24 or 26, then we're going to put an excessive load on the bearings and the connecting rods of the pump. We're also going to make it very hard for this pneumatic to regulate because it becomes difficult, for instance, to regulate, to drop the pressure from 30 down to 6 or 7 at the first intensity. So this is a very important regulation. All right, let me open up the piano turn the pump off and put the chain back on and then we can go on to the rest of our t test roll. Now let's assume that we've let's assume that we've now adjusted our pressure now. We know that the pump is putting out about with the motor running about 24 inches. Now let's run over here and we'll set this combination of 2 and 8 on the accompaniment. This means this is going to collapse and this is going to collapse moving this forward. This is the point where we should put the tube in the hole, listen, and find that the air has just closed off. Now, the next thing that's going to happen is that they're going to check the theme dynamics. And we will watch them collapse and making sure that they collapse in sequence that we have this pneumatic collapsing, this pneumatic collapsing, then the four collapsing, and then the eight collapsing, and then again we're going to get two and ten, which will collapse these two, and we can adjust the knife valve. Now how do we adjust the knife valve? Well, if it's on the theme side, you can loosen this note or this nut right here, and when they're collapsed, move this back and forth, move the shaft back and forth just to the point where you hear it cut off at 10. The same thing on the accompaniment side. There is an adjustment screw right here. We can loosen it and then move, set this knife valve when this is collapsed at 8 and 10 so that the vacuum is just closed off so that, that's, so that we know that it's closing off just at 10. All right. Now, now that we've got all that groundwork, we come back to the test roll and we find that they talk about the, the various collapses of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the accordion pneumatics. And they give you a little diagram on this roll, which is very useful, of where the various regulating screws and other things are. And we come to the very next test, which is the very, very important zero intensity or the test which is the lowest intensity which the duo art will play. At this point, none of the accordions are collapsed. What we're going to do and what they use, what they depend on in this test is that when the sustaining pedal is on over here, it raises the dampers off the back of the keys, which makes it just slightly less difficult to play and you want to set your piano so that the, the arpeggio which is coming up plays very, very softly, but plays evenly. Now the idea is that you're using the resistance of the piano itself, and you're setting this, this particular expression box to fit this particular piano. And that's the beauty of the system, because it's, there's no guesswork. You're not guessing if it's playing softly, because look what happens. When this arpeggio plays, the sustaining pedal will be on and the notes will play very, very softly. And again. Now, when they turn the sustaining pedal off and the arpeggio is played a little faster, the extra resistance that with the damper sitting back on the back side of the keys 
means that these notes should not play or play occasionally. If they all play or if they play about the same intensity, then we haven't set them up correctly. So let's go back to the beginning of this test and go through it all the way. The first arpeggio, first two arpeggios should play very softly and the third arpeggio with the sustaining pedal off should play only occasional notes. And you can see that those notes, most of them missed, which is exactly where we want it to be. Now, what happens if we find that we don't get the results that we just... Of course, I made sure that this piano was in, in good regulation to show you what it should sound like. Well, then we've got to go to the zero adjustment, which is right here on the expression box. Now, there are two screws here. This is the lock screw, and this is the adjustment screw. Never, never, never attempt to turn the this screw, which is the adjustment screw, without loosening the lock screw. If you do, you will not adjust anything. All you'll do is succeeding is stripping out the threads that are located in here, which means it'll make it very, very difficult for you to adjust the duoart at all, and uh, you'll have to rotate the shaft and do all sorts of things or take the shaft down and repair it. So please remember that before you make any adjustments to loosen this one first, and then turn this one either to the right or left to either drop the pressure down if it's too loud or raise the pressure up if it's um, not loud enough. And the theme and the accompaniment are both the same. This is the accompaniment side, the theme is on the outside. All right, let's take a look at, let's go through those two tests again and see what they should sound like. So let me re-roll this. Again, these notes should play very, very softly with the sustaining pedal on. And these should play only occasional notes. Now this is a second test just to make sure that the first test is correct. Now we're going to check the accompaniment. The accompaniment tests if we read the test roll, it says the theme, I'm sorry, we're going to set the theme, should be set one degree louder than the accompaniment. The solo theme is distinguished by the double dot. So if we look carefully, we will find there are double dots, of course, on this side and this side, depending on which side the note is playing. The question has often been raised, what is one degree? Well, one degree means a little louder. And through experience, many people have found that if we use a gauge, in testing this, that about one inch of vacuum more on the theme gives you about the res right results. But there's a test also for the theme on this roll. So we, let's go back to this and we will hear that the accompaniment comes on. This is the accompaniment with a loud pedal on. Now here comes the theme. just slightly louder. And with the loud pedal off, these don't play. And that's where the theme should be. So they do give you a, sec a, a test for what they mean by one degree louder. One degree louder means that you can hear that it's slightly louder. This particular theme is set up to just about one inch higher than the accompaniment. And when this little arpeggio with no sustaining pedal comes along, it's very fast. It's played on the bass end of the piano, which means the hammers are a little, he hammers are a little heavier. You find that they don't play or only occasional notes. So we can listen to that part. Now, now we come to the second section of the test roll, which is equally as essential. It's always uh, amazing to me that people will sit down and spend hours and hours and hours getting the arpeggio test correct and then totally ignore or sort of brush through these chord tests. It's the chord tests that give you the sets or where to actually, in practice, set these openings. 
because the chord tests, the, the test roll, or the piano has to pass the chord test, and if it, don't, if it doesn't, then we set these particular only. Let's see how this works. We come to the first test where we're going to be dealing with the accompaniment, and these chords should not play, and they don't. Now we come to the first number one accompaniment dynamics. These chords should play at when this first dynamic on the accompaniment collapses. Let's take a close look at these chords. We'll notice they are two chords, each three notes. You'll notice that they play clearly but very softly. Now, let's look at this next one. It says these chords should not play at one or play very softly. You'll notice that these are five notes. Now, it's a characteristics of the, the uh, a Duart expression pneumatic that while it will be able to supply enough vacuum to play these three notes, it will not, if it's set correctly, at first intensity supply enough vacuum to play these five notes, or at least they will play raggedly. And you will hear in some of the tests that the notes sometimes play or play and then come in and drop out again. So they're not playing distinctly and quietly. So the, and it says these chords should not play at one or play very softly. And you could hear that the bass one, there was one that came in uh, ahead of the others and the others kind of dropped out. Now, if we find that that's not the results we're getting. If, for instance, these chords play on the accompaniment test, then we haven't done the arpeggios correctly. We better go back and check the arpeggios. If we find that these chords with the three do not play, then we've got to increase this distance a little bit so it collapses just a little bit more, so that this distance collapses a little bit more and will give us just a slightly higher vacuum. You're going to need a vacuum gauge again, connected to one of the notes, and so that you can check exactly what's happening. And using the vacuum gauge, we're able to t tell what's going to be happening. We can tell how much we're adjusting these, how much we're changing them, and how much change we're making in them. And we're going to need the readings a little later when we set number eight, but more of that. If we find that these notes play, and these play too, then we find what we've done is that we have too much vacuum on number one and we've got to close that gap. So the idea is have the first set of chords play, the second set doesn't play. Now let's look at the next test that's coming up. The next test is going to be testing our number two according dynamics. And here we have four notes that play or should play and a second group of four notes that should play. But when the next test comes up, these are eight. And the eight should not play or play very, very softly or play raggedly. Let's see what happens there. All right, these should play, and these should not. And we can hear that they played in the upper area, they played very raggedly, and so that uh, that's set correctly. The next test, has that we'll be checking the number four accompaniment dynamic and we have that we should have seven notes play here and seven notes play here but we when we get these enormous groups of notes up here they shouldn't play and you can hear that some of them played and some of them didn't play that means number four is set correctly well now we come to the big dilemma of the test roll when we come to the next test, which is the power eight accompaniment dynamic, all we have is a couple of chords, a couple of loud chords. What do we do with it? Well, eight was the, is the half point, wave point of the intensity scale. And I suspect that what they intended you to do is to estimate that that two chords was about halfway the loudness that the dual art can play. But there's another way to approach this. If, for instance, we take a piece of graph paper and we use our gauge and we actually check what we are reading in each of the steps, we can make a graph that looks something like this. Now, I've done this ahead of time. 
Along the bottom, what we have here are the steps. And so what I've done along this axis, I have step 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, and 16, the steps of the duor. Along this axis, up here, we have pressure, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, or inches of water vacuum. I often use pressure and vacuum uh, interchangeably. But this is really inches of vacuum up here. These are the intensity steps. Now earlier, I measured what the intensity of this piano or the vacuum that for s the zero intensity or when the arpeggios were playing. And I found that it was a little above five. Then, when we checked step one, I checked again and I found it was a little above six. I checked step four, and I found that it was just a little about nine, a little above nine. Now, it's a characteristic of the Duart regulator that it regulates in a straight line. This is not true of the Ampico, but it is true of the Duart. We can find what step eight is by extrapolating the curve. So I drew a line from zero uh, through these points, and if they're set correctly, it will produce a straight line. And I found that this was the little segment of the line that I got, this portion here. The red segment of the line is what I extrapolate. So all I did was simply extend this straight line up to this point. That gave me a point where the line crossed step eight. And I read off the graph over this point that step eight should be somewhere around 14 or 15 inches. So I moved to step eight back here. Move to step eight, and using my gauge, can check to see that I'm getting about 14 inches of vacuum. If I'm getting any less than that, then I've got to open up the gap. If I'm getting more than that, then I've got to close up the gap. Now I can go on to the combination. That's the highest combination. That's all of the intensities collapse, and now. I should hear a very definite dynamic buildup. They're going to check uh, the dynamics at 2, 5, 9, 12, and 15. And what you should do, if you want to make sure that you've done this correctly, is go back to your graph, plot steps 5, 9, 12, and 15, and see that they fall on the graph. If they don't, you're going to find that most duarts exhibit a upward turn, something like this at the top and but if in this area here you're not getting straight line then you've got something wrong with the expression system and you'd better check it out or your uh, intensities are not correct so let's see what this produces now we're going to do exactly the same thing with the theme test and what they're going to do with the theme test is give you a series of chords it should play and should not play. If, for instance, again, the chords, and notice that on the theme where the accompaniment was able to play only three notes at the first intensity, on the theme, they're able to play four notes, which means the theme is set slightly higher than the accompaniment. So where we had three and three notes playing, we now have four and four. I'm gonna go through this section fairly rapidly because it's simply a repetition of what the accompaniment was doing should play and these should not or play very softly these should play he should not these should play these should not and now we come to eight again or four these should not now we come to eight and again eight we have no guide for so we can do the same thing with the accompaniment we could plot all our pressures here on the accompaniment then Take a straight edge, draw it, and we find what our theme should be at step eight. And then we can adjust accordingly. If we, we should also find that our theme steps are always above the accompaniment by about the same distance. If we find we're getting crossing over like this, then something is drastically wrong. The two lines when we finish should be practically parallel, except when we hit the crash will go up like that. So we should have these two lines be parallel, the accompaniment should be on the bottom, and then about an inch difference between the two, we should have the theme following the accompaniment on the top.
and now 50 to the loudest. This is also a way to check to make sure the crash is coming on. And now the build up again, two, five, nine, 12, and 15. All right, now at this point, we have one more adjustment to make before we can go on to the final two tests of the two musical selections at the end of the roll, and that's to adjust the crash. Because we've adjusted down here, or right in here, I'm sorry, we've adjusted the zero intensity, it means that our crash is probably out of adjustment. So when we have, and it has to be adjusted so that it comes on when step or all four of these accompaniments are, cra are collapsed, we can go to the test roll where, and it's only, of course, the theme, when all four of the theme are collapsed, that the crash comes on. What we can do is we can use the part of the test rule at the very end of the buildup where all four of these are collapsed and we can see if the theme is coming on. The theme is adjusted by two things. It's adjusted either by loosening this screw, which loosens the whole arm, so that you can rotate the arm. And what we want to do is set the arm when all four of them are collapsed to about that position, tighten the screw, and then use the setting screw here, turning it just until this pallet is open. And we can hear the theme come on, and we can also see the, uh, the crash come on, and we can also see the theme collapse. We want to make sure that we have the theme coming on just when we have four of these collapsed. And what we can do to make sure of that is pinch off number two, so number, or sorry, number one, so that number one opens and the crash should go off. When we allow number one to, uh, this is assuming these th three are collapsed, when number one comes back on again, the crash should come back on again. So it's a very critical set. And in fact, you have to readjust the crash anytime you change the zero adjustment. Um, if you don't adjust the crash correctly, you will find that either the crash will never come on, which you will go and you're going to lose some brilliancy in your music, or it will come on too soon, which means you're going to lose some of the subtle intensities. Now, back to the test roll. They provide for you at the very end two musical selections. The first one is Valse in E flat played by Bauer, and it contains or tests several things. First of all, the first chord that comes up here is a crash chord, so you should see, and if you're underneath the piano, you should be able to see the crash come on, and if you're here, you should be able to hear the crash come on. Let's go Now, when we get to this section of the roll, these accompaniment chords, these three little uh, three note chords here should be very quiet, while the theme here, which is a very rapidly repeated theme, should be very distinct. So we're checking, first of all, to make sure the theme is working and that the repetition is good. Let me start at the very beginning of the roll again, and as it plays, I will point out some of these, some of these features. Crash chord, crash chord. Soft accompaniment chords here, here, and here, while a very distinct melody here. Again, soft accompaniment chords here, while the distinct melody over here. The last selection on the test roll is Indian Love Call from Rosemary, and its purpose is to check the very soft or lowest level playing of the duo art to make sure that it does play very, very softly, very, very delicately, and to make sure that there are no notes dropped at these lower levels. And finally, the last hole coming up is the rewind hole to check and see if the rewind is working. You could check if you wish 
when you're through, check the repeat by putting the repeat on and see if, um, if the repeat does indeed work. If you follow these steps carefully, if you follow them and follow your test roll carefully and adjust all of the intensity steps carefully, you will find that you will have a wonderfully sounding duart and it will play delicately and it will play loudly and it will be beautiful to listen to.